I appreciate the opportunity to come in and give my um, obnoxious American views about uh, fire in Tasmania after being here a whopping 10 weeks. Uh, but I hope that what I'll be able to do today is uh, give a little bit of a global perspective uh, and relate to you some of the things that we've been doing in the States. Um, in addition to being a pyrogeographer in the same vein as David, uh, I also started out as a wildland firefighter. Uh, and in the U.S., of course, uh, most of our firefighting forces Forces in the federal level government. So once upon a time, I drove a big green U.S. Forest Service fire engine. Uh, so that really shapes a lot of the research that I conduct now and my perspective on fire. Uh, so... Oops, there we go. Uh, for the last few years, I've been looking at uh, large fires globally and trying to think about how changes in global climate are manifesting in changes in global fire regimes. Uh, and I've been sort of keeping this record of extreme fire events that we're seeing. So, for example, in 2017, uh, we had extreme events such as a fire in Greenland and a peat bog that was covered in ice not that that long ago. Uh, we had a fire, a whole series of fires uh, in the Pacific Northwest portion of U.S. and uh, Canada in B.C. and then three states or four states in the northwestern part of the U.S. that produced a smoke event. Uh, imagine the last week or two in Hobart when it was really smoky, uh, except that was the whole summer for us. Uh, and then, of course, also in 2017, uh, we saw extreme fire in South Africa associated with drought and extreme winds, uh, and that occurred in June. And of course, when I show this slide in the U.S., people give me this blank stare because they forget that for you in the Southern Hemisphere, June is winter. Uh, so that was 2017. We followed it up in 2018 with some more extreme events. In November, we had the uh, most fatal wildfire in a century in the U.S. in the campfire in California. 86 people died. An entire town of 27,000 people uh, was basically burnt to the ground. Uh, that followed up a fire in Greece last summer, uh, which had over 100 fatalities, uh, some of which died only feet from the ocean along the coast of Greece. Uh, and then, of course, here in Australia, just in December, uh, you had rainforest burning in Queensland. Of course, now that's completely inundated with the floods, uh, but this is an extreme event. Tropical rainforest is not supposed to burn. Um, so these are all examples of how fire regimes are producing this change and resulting in incredibly extreme events. So uh, I wish I could predict fire seasons like this. I'd be much richer. Uh, and I can't, but it was just sort of luck that uh, for a fire scientist, it's lucky to have the type of fire season uh, that you are currently experiencing here in Tasmania. And what I want to examine today uh, is those fires in this global context and ask, is this really a disaster? Uh, and I'm going to look at that in a global context with what we've seen with other disasters, but then also look at what can Tasmania expect in the future with regards to bushfire. Uh, and in my purview, a little bit more importantly, how can you best prepare for those future bushfires? Because they will happen. They are inevitable. Uh, and I will show you some examples from the U.S. that may or may not transfer, but I think some of the things that we're doing in the U.S. could potentially transfer here. So globally, what we're seeing is this incredible increase in fire potential, right? And the conditions that are conducive to extreme fire have significantly increased uh, over the last three decades. Uh, and this increase is spatially very heterogeneous, right? Some areas of the globe are not experiencing quite as extreme of a change, others are. Uh, where I am from in the western U.S., uh, that is an area highlighted in red on these maps, we are seeing these warmer, drier conditions. Uh, you are also seeing them in southeastern Australia and Tasmania. So these are conducive to more extreme fire events. <laughs> And that extreme fire environment, those conditions, then are conducive to more extreme fire 
disasters globally, right? And this is a data set. This is brand new analysis uh, that Grant Williamson just mapped it out for me uh, the other day. And we basically have a almost 40-year uh, data set of global wildfire disasters that we're looking at. And what we're seeing is that wildfire disasters are everywhere and that they are increasing everywhere. And we see these fire disasters. Now this data set is defining a disaster as a fatality event or an event that produces considerable economic losses. This is put together by a reinsurer, uh, which is responsible for all those uh, insurance claims. So this event is, or these, these events uh, are all over the place. Uh, and when we look at trends over different areas, what we see is that the number of disasters has increased uh, over the last 40 years. The losses associated with those disasters, it's highly variable, right? And these are all normalized by country uh, and all those sorts of things. So the, the variability is pretty high because of the difference uh, between really high GDP countries and low excuse me, low GDP countries. Uh, but what we see is that we've, in the last few years, have some incredibly disastrous events. And those really high numbers in the last couple of years are predominantly from the US. Uh, what is more striking in my mind is the fatalities. Uh, because, again, fatalities are highly variable. We see these huge spikes from single events. Uh, so in 1997, uh, there was a large fatal wildfire event in China. You may or may not have heard of that. Uh, in, of course, uh, the more recent period in 2009, you have Black Saturday producing uh, a high point on this graphic as well. Uh, in 2008, that's actually from Indonesia, large fatal event associated with the peat fires in Indonesia. So high variability of actual numbers of people dying from wildfires, but overall, the number of fatal fire events significantly increasing. When we look at Australia specifically, right, we see this increase in the number of fire disasters over the last 40 years. Uh, we don't necessarily see the increase in the number of fatal events. As a country, Australia has actually not had that many fatal events, of course, outside a couple of really large ones that are basically uh, the focus of a lot of the memory associated with wildfires here, like Black Saturday, uh, like the 67 fires uh, here in Tasmania. But one of the things that's interesting is that when we look at per capita fire disasters, because uh, of course uh, my country has about 350 million people, a um, little bit less than that here. Uh, so when we look at per capita disasters, while the US has by far the highest number of wildfire disasters, this is a broken axis because it goes way the heck out to the right. Uh, Australia has the second highest number of fire disasters but by far the highest per capita fire disasters. Not a surprise. Most of the population of Australia lives in this incredibly fire prone and fire adapted Mediterranean environment on the southeast coast and into the temperate forests uh, in Victoria and in Tasmania. Okay. So this is a place that has had some pretty significant fire disasters historically. Uh, it's also very much a function of the ecology here and the vegetation types because what we see when we look globally is that certain vegetation types are very disproportionately associated with fire disasters. Uh, so in this graphic, it's ordered by the percent of the global population that lives in that ecosystem. Okay, so most of the global population lives in the tropics, in those uh, tropical forests, right? Uh, but as we start moving down the graphic, the percent of fatal fires and percent of disaster fires are the red and the blue. And what they show us is that the Mediterranean forests only 4% of the global population lives in the Mediterranean system. 
but a third of the fire disasters happen in the Mediterranean system. So not a surprise that Australia is the place with the highest per capita fire disasters. So what does that mean for 2019 in Tasmania? First, I wanted to ask, are these really disasters? Because it's been very interesting for me uh, watching the news, having people that I talk to, uh, you know, my kids' daycare teachers, various people I've met here, and they have a very sort of different perspective on the fires than I do. And so I wanted to try and look at some of the data. When we ask if the 2019, 2018-2019 uh, bushfires are a disaster, first of all, there's been no fatalities. Uh, that may not seem like a big deal. Maybe it is a big deal to you. Uh, it's for somebody who spent all of November doing media for the campfire in California. I can't tell you how many times I had to talk about people dying and what it does to their families, what it does to the community, um, and how how almost ridiculous it is that I feel like we can do things to prevent these mass fatality wildfires. Uh, and so to see no fatalities when there were a couple of days in January that we could have had a mass fatality event if somebody had done something stupid in Hobart when there was wind, when it was 38C, that was a potential fire disaster day, a potential for high fatalities, and it wasn't realized. And so that's pretty impressive to me. Uh, of course, smoke exposure was really high throughout the region. That has major implications. Uh, the number of homes consumed, the most recent figure I saw was seven. I don't know if that's been updated. Uh, that will probably make it into that data set because there'll be some losses associated with that. Um, the cost of suppression, tens of millions of dollars, right? So that's a pretty big number for our Tasmania. Uh, and I saw where your premier has asked for funding to help support that, right? So that, that's a big number. Uh, not even remotely close to what the U.S. is at, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but the number of hectares burnt is the figure that I see most cited across the media. Um, and over 2,000 hectares, that's a lot of area, right? And it's second in the Tasmanian recorded history uh, to 1967. But the problem with reporting area is that it's actually really, really misleading because fire effects matter a lot more than the actual area. Uh, now, we've been impatiently waiting for satellites to capture a nice clear scene uh, of the fires. They're not, co well, I should say they're, they're not cooperating. The clouds are not cooperating. So we haven't got a nice clear scene yet. But once we do, right, we'll be able to actually map these fires. Uh, and look at what the heterogeneity of that effect is by producing fire severity maps. And so this is an example uh, from a recent paper out of David's lab where they map fire severity uh, for a 2013 bushfire over by Denali on Tasman Pen Peninsula. Okay, so you can see that that was a big fire, and yet there was enormous heterogeneity within the fire in terms of the actual impact on the forest. Okay, so that's the type of thing that will give us a better idea how much impact there actually was in terms of tree mortality and whatnot across these fires. The other thing that is, of course, really critical here is understanding not just how much of the forest was impacted, but which types of forests were impacted. And of course, the paleo endemics are incredibly important here, right? That old Gondwanan vegetation uh, that everybody loves. And, you know, I don't know what actually burnt. All I did was pull the threatened, uh, threatened species layer out of uh, Tazveg and threw the perimeters on there and said, okay, here's where the two things that I hear the most about, the pencil pines and the king billy pines. Here's where they are at across the landscape and here's where the perimeters are at. All the pink stuff is where those two different pine species are, uh, and the red is the perimeters, and the yellow is where the perimeters intersect with that. It doesn't mean it's burned, just means that's where it's intersected, okay? So when we look at the two fires that had the greatest potential, the Gel River fire, no intersection between those threatened species and the actual fire perimeter. When we look at the Riveau Road fire, at a little tiny bit of intersection between the perimeter and those threatened species. Again, doesn't mean that they actually were burnt, just means that that's what fell in the perimeter. It's only a few hectares. It's a tiny, tiny amount. Um, what's really impressive is how much it could have been because 
This fire was headed straight southeast into this big stand of paleoendemic vegetation. Uh, and, you know, based on what I'm seeing in this perimeter here, I'm suspecting that was also an area that parks and TFS focused a lot on in trying to contain that perimeter right there so it didn't get into the paleoendemics. Um, so the big concern for a lot of folks was those areas. And what we're seeing is that it's not quite the disaster it could have been right? A few hectares. We don't know what actually happened. This is just a GIS exercise, uh, but it's a lot less worrisome uh, than I think a lot of people initially thought. And of course, this is a landscape that is evolved to burn, right? Uh, one of the things that struck me, you know, I, I come from a place where everything is conifers. Uh, and so I get to Tasmania and man, this this eucalyptus stuff, this is everywhere. Uh, and it's absolutely phenomenal to drive across the island. The first couple weeks we were here, uh, we drove an enormous, I should say my husband drove an enormous amount because I was the one waving my hands and looking out the window and taking pictures. Um, you know, and you go someplace like the Hearts Mountains and you can see, oh yeah, there's a lot of fire on the past on this landscape. And you have all these places where the trees burned at some point. There's still all of these uh, old, tree stems, and then all of the eucalypt is growing back uh, to be this next generation forest. So those areas, yeah, a lot of it burnt in these fires, but they're designed to come back and to come back just fine. One of the things that uh, is also of concern is, of course, the big trees. Uh, we were very lucky to make it out to the Tahoon Airwalk uh, before it burned, but the, the big trees that are there and up in the Styx Valley, uh, those are areas that people are also concerned about, right? These are major tourist attractions. You have the tallest uh, flowering plant and angiosperm in the world uh, here in Tasmania, so people are concerned, right? W one of the things that struck me when we went out to see the Arv big tree was, okay, yeah, here's this huge huge giant tree, right? But one of the things that I looked at that was right next to it is this old tree stub that's got this giant cat face going 60 meters up the side of the tree that has obviously seen a lot of fire, right? So these big trees have survived enormous amounts of fire in the past as evidenced by their neighbors, right? And in reality, Consumption in the understory is one of the things that helps facilitate tree growth in general uh, in low severity fire regimes because it releases a lot of those nutrients. Okay, so this is not as much of a concern uh, as it could be. I don't know, maybe those trees are toast. I haven't been out there, I'm not gonna claim to know what happened to them. But it's the sort of thing I look at and think, okay, just because there was fire there doesn't mean those trees are gone. Uh, this is a couple of pictures that uh, Tim Wardlaw sent to me uh, from the LTER flux tower down at Wara. Uh, one of the things that I noticed immediately was, hey, look, no dead black tree stops. Sweet. Uh, what I see is a lot of green crown canopy and some orangish crown canopy. And when we zoom in on this a little bit closer from some aerial flights, uh, what this picture shows is that, again, this is predominantly a low severity understory burn, at least on this site, right? And this is not even torching on these trees. This is just scorching. Enough heat from the understory being produced to scorch those leaves, turn them red, right? Uh, but not actually get up into the crown. So this is not a crown fire in this site, right? This is predominantly low severity. Even up in the highlands, uh, we drove up through the highlands this weekend because when you're a fire scientist and fires happen, you're like, let's go see. Uh, so we go up to the highlands and I'm thinking, okay, this is a place that there was a lot of fire. This is a really big uh, fire up there. And most of it is burning at moderate to higher severity, but still not getting into the crowns, right? This is scorch in the crowns rather than torch. There wasn't consumption in the crown. Uh, and even across the surface, uh, it's pretty spotty. There's still a lot of biomass on the surface. It's not full consumption of the, um, the surface duff layer to ash. There's not a lot of white in this picture, which is an indicator of really high intensity uh, turning things to ash. Um, low severity in some places, I look at this and I think, okay, this is all probably gonna regenerate. Uh, 
and there's old trees up there again with cat faces that indicate that there's been a lot of fire in the past. It's all regenerated. This tree is still happy and healthy. And in some places this burned two weeks ago and it's already regenerating with about a half a meter high new eucalypt sprouts. So that's pretty happy and healthy. Grass is coming back pretty darn nice already, right? This is a very concerning year. It was very dry in January, record dry January, right? People are really concerned about how this stuff burned. It's regenerating like it evolved to do. Uh, one thing that did strike me about driving through the highlands uh, was all those little holiday shacks. Uh, because what the potential disaster could have been up there was all these little shacks going up in smoke. Uh, and we were driving around and every single shack had this lovely wood pile either stacked up next to the building or the garage or in this giant culvert thing and they had all the wood piled up a few meters away from the building and of course they have nice wood decks and all these things and i looked at that and thought oh boy that's the problem in the highlands it's not the vegetation burning it's all these little vacation communities that are completely unprepared and not built to, to, to deal with wildfire, right? Um, and so those are the areas that could be the disasters of the future. Uh, and uh, of course, the World Heritage Areas of concern, not many hectares burned based on the GIS analysis. Of course, people need to get out and have a look at it to see what uh, it really looks like, right? And this is a pretty amazing place. It's not the only place in the world that has fire-sensitive world heritage areas. Uh, this, is <laughs> this is the place where I grew up. Uh, this is Olympic National Park in Washington. It's home to a temperate rainforest. Um, and when I went to that sort of uh, world heritage area at Mount Field and got up into the, the Ganwan and stuff, my first thought was, oh man, this is primeval. Oh, this is just like home. It's the same type of vegetation, uh, not in terms of species, but in terms of sensitivity to fire. This is not a place that burns. It's a rainforest, it's incredibly wet, uh, and the estimates of fire regimes in the system are that historically it burns somewhere around once every 4,000 years, right? Now, this isn't a paleoendemic the way that the Gondwan vegetation is, but a lot of the trees in this forest are literally 4,000 years old, okay? So they're not used to fire. Everybody was terrified of fire, and they didn't have a lot for a long time. But just in the last five, six years, there have been multiple large fires in this national park. Uh, and it is uh, really beginning to show that a, fire is happening with climate change in these areas that never used to burn, but B, that it's not as bad as we thought it could be. So when they they had a uh, 1,500 acres, so about a uh, 600 hectare fire uh, in this national park just a couple years ago, and they were terrified, oh man, it's gonna burn up all these really old trees we have. The trees actually did okay, even the trees that are supposed to be fire-sensitive species, right? They got a little bit of charring along the, the roots, some of the moss burned up, but for the most part, the fire burned at relatively low severity um, and actually did some nice job of clearing out some old dead trees and some dead wood along the ground that opened up patches in the forest and created this beautiful mosaic. So looking towards the future, what can Tasmania expect? Uh, first of all, it can expect basically a lot more fire due to warming and drying conditions, right? Uh, and this is a map from some work done here by uh, Paul Fox Hughes at uh, Bureau Met and colleagues here at uh, University of Tasmania, basically showing, okay, we're gonna see this massive increase uh, in fire danger over the course of the 21st century, right? And when we look at, there we go. Uh, when we look at specifically January, right, the month uh, that really matters, right, the fraction of Januarys with extreme fire danger increases between four and five fold over the 21st century. So what does that mean? The potential for these extreme fire years, if we used to only have them uh, maybe once every 20, 30 years, we might start be looking at these things every five to seven years. Okay, so they asked me on their radio this morning, uh, could we have this type of fire year again next year, or is it not gonna be for 30 or 40 years? And my answer was, if I was a betting woman, I would bet on sooner rather than later. 
Okay, so this is going to keep happening, these large fire years, because this is one of those transitional areas in climate change. And this is not just Tasmania. This is very much a global process. We're seeing these areas that are transitional. They used to be not nearly as fire prone as somewhere adjacent, say, in a Mediterranean system, right? Southeastern Australia, New South Wales, Victoria, they've always had a lot of fire. Tasmania has not always had a lot of fire. But under climate change, it will start to move in that direction. And that is true globally across these sort of uh, temperate forest Mediterranean transition sites. So what can we do? The tendency after a big event like this, anywhere in the world, okay, is to want to figure out who's to blame, what happened, what didn't happen, what are we going to do about it, right? How, how are we going to place the blame? Because that's what politicians love to do. As a scientist uh, who works across the human environment spectrum, and I do a lot of work still with uh, fire management agencies in the U.S., that's one of the legacies of me coming from uh, firefighting, I want to look at how do we learn from this to move forward and try and find solutions so that we can be prepared for the next event. So the first thing we need to do is agree on the key objectives, right? We need to look at what is the thing that we can all agree on as the top priority? Most communities that I've worked with, when you really get down to it, they all agree that life safety is the top priority, okay? We should not be having deaths from fires. Uh, it is my mother's greatest fear to be burned alive. I have to say that I agree with her to some extent. That's a little terrifying. Uh, it's one of those really, it's, it's one of those things that I feel like we should be able to prevent. A lot of natural hazard fatalities, we can't really prevent them very well. Uh, but fires are one of those things that we have a much better opportunity to control the outcome in terms of fatalities. If we get to the point where we all agree that that's the top thing, okay, well, what's next? We can all agree that wildfire is a community concern, not an individual one, right? We all have to have a responsibility in that. Uh, and the third thing is that we really just need to look at the future. We can't be trying to plan for wildfire based on what happened in the past because that climate, we will never experience that again in our lives. We're past that. It's only going to continue changing. So how do we plan for the future? There's three options available. One is 100% prevention. We're going to just stop all ignitions from happening. Um, we actually believed we could do this in the U.S. for a long time. I have no idea why, because, man, lightning starts a heck of a lot of fires. Uh, and for you here in Tasmania, there's been some work uh, that has come out of this university recently that showed that it doesn't really matter what the incidence of lightning is. It actually hasn't changed. What is changing is that the vegetation is becoming drier and more receptive. The fuels are becoming more receptive to igniting from that lightning strike, right? So you're going to keep having lightning ignitions. All right, so 100% prevention now. What about 100% suppression? Uh, the U.S. spent 100 years building up one heck of a military industrial complex trying to suppress all fires. Uh, in 1924, the U.S. government came up with this policy called the 10 a.m. policy. For whatever fire that starts, we're going to put it out by 10 o'clock the next morning. Didn't work so good. And the U.S. is still, in many ways, trying to suppress all fires. But we've spent the last 40 years really moderating and revising how we go about addressing that. We no longer fight fires uh, assuming that we're going to be able to put every single fire out. We use a really big spectrum where some fires are just observed and let uh, they, they do their own thing. You have uh, some similar approaches to that for uh, fires that are more on the West Coast where it's uh, basically allowed to burn its natural course, right? There's not this major attempt to actually try and suppress that fire. Uh, we don't have a stay and defend type of policy. Uh, so anything for us that's near a community, uh, we try and suppress fully. And in the process of trying to suppress them fully, we have spent an absolutely obscene amount of money. Uh, this goes up to 2017 and 2018. We spent over $3 billion trying to suppress fires. And for our $3 billion, we have gotten several major fatality events, about 8 million acres a year burned, 
it's not very effective. We're still learning. Uh, but what we have found is that that money is much better spent working on the preparation side than on the suppression side. So option three is to reduce wildfire vulnerability and try and put our, a lot more of our eggs in that basket. So how do we actually reduce wildfire vulnerability? We want to try and prepare for the worst case scenario. There's not a lot of things in science or in life that we really are preparing for the worst case scenario. Uh, for natural hazards planning, we do want to prepare for the worst case scenario because if it happens and we didn't prepare for it, that's when the finger pointing game starts. Who didn't think this could happen, right? So how do we actually go about doing that? Uh, we use a vulnerability framework uh, and I should mention this is very slowly, painfully gaining traction in the states. Um, the U.S. Uh, scientists, fire scientists and fire agencies have been hyper focused on exposure uh, for years and years and years trying to simply reduce the risk of fires and fire spread. Uh, they are slowly figuring out that doesn't work. That to really address wildfire vulnerability, we need to look at all three pieces of vulnerability, exposure, sensitivity, and resilience or adaptive capacity. Uh, and so these three components have both a social and an ecological side. For exposure and risk, we're just really looking at what's the potential for fire, right? And what's the potential for different types of fire behavior? What is on that landscape? How flammable is it? For sensitivity, uh, on a social side of things, we're looking predominantly at what are the demographics of the population. Because when you have an event and you assume that all humans that are in, uh, potentially impacted by that event are created equal, well, they are in terms of rights, but not in terms of impacts, okay? So we saw this in Yuan Valley when there was this uh, process to begin evacuating people out of Huon Valley. Who gets evacuated first, right? Pregnant women, children, elderly, people with disabilities, right? The s most sensitive portions of the population get evacuated first. We should also be looking at it on the flip side for preparation, trying to identify those populations uh, and understand what their additional needs are beyond just what the general population needs. And then resilience. During a fire and then particularly after that fire, right? How resilient is this population? Uh, and population in terms of people, population in terms of flora and fauna as well, right? Paleoendemics, not resilient to wildfire. So if that is a top priority for Tasmanians to try and save, what needs to be done in addition to the general fire management component to try and save those things? with populations, right? What components of the population are the least resilient? Uh, you know, okay, I'm always, I say the town wrong all the time. Jeeveston, Jeeveston, I never know if the G is hard or not. So that town is heavily dependent on the tourism out to Tahoon and the forest. And they have just lost a huge portion of their, the small businesses have just lost a huge portion of their summer income. Right, and they're gonna continue to lose it in the months ahead until some of those areas reopen. How resilient are they? If there's someone that lives down there and they're commuting up to Hobart and they've still got a job, maybe they're pretty resilient, right? If there's someone that is locally dependent on that tourism industry, not so much. Trying to understand a lot of those secondary fire effects helps us improve our population resilience to wildfire and helps us better plan for what we're gonna do. So a couple examples from the US of strategies that we are now employing to try and address vulnerability to wildfire in this framework. Uh, I worked with a community called Montecito, California a few years ago, uh, and they are really, really proactive. Uh, part of it is being a very rich community, Oprah, Okay, Oprah, our big TV star. You guys all know who Oprah is, right? Yeah, okay. Pretty sure she's a global phenomenon. Uh, 
Oprah lives here, right? Ellen DeGeneres lives here. Celebrities live here. This is a rich person place. So, you know, they have some money to throw at this problem. Uh, and what they undertook was really trying to address vulnerability across this framework. Uh, and what they figured out was that trying to do it top down with these sort of orders wasn't going to work. So they built this system from the bottom up and they did a lot of small things and they did them in equal partnership with the community. When I say they, I mean the Montecito Fire Department, which is the local uh, fire protection district. Uh, and so they hired two people whose job it was specifically to work with homeowners and with the community. They facilitated an enormous amount of communication and they undertook two types of strategies across the community, individual strategies and community-wide strategies. So with individual homeowners, they did things like develop defensible space around the house, places where they could remove all the flammable vegetation and stuff, wooden things attached to the house, wood piles piled up against the side of the house, things like that. Uh, so they removed all all this stuff so that that house would actually be defendable by firefighters right during a fire uh, they did things like change their zoning and work with homeowners to address that uh, work on improving fire resistant construction on new homes uh, evacuation compliance is a huge problem for us in the US because we have mandatory evacuation there's a lot of people that want to stay and defend but we don't have that yet as a policy so they work on evacuation compliance trying to harden their existing homes, doing little things like changing the windows to something less likely to break, cleaning out gutters, uh, putting fine screen mesh over vents so that embers don't get into the house and burn the house down from the inside out because that is actually one of the most common ways for houses to burn down is embers getting in the house, sucked in through the attic vent. Um, so lots of individual level change. At the community level, they did a lot of work to reduce vegetative fuels. They did this along road systems. Uh, this is an area that <laughs> there's a heck of a lot of eucalypts there. If all of you went to Montecito, California, you'd be like, yeah, it looks just like home uh, because there's a certain species of eucalypt that's incredibly invasive across California. Everybody thinks it looks pretty. It burns great there, just like it does here. Uh, so they've got these narrow, windy roads. Sound familiar? Uh, that the vegetation grows in this nice tunnel, provides lots of shade, looks really pretty. When you have a giant fire engine trying to get through or people trying to evacuate a neighborhood, really problematic. So they did enormous amounts of cutting back vegetation from the roads uh, and then putting little fuel breaks in, these um, vegetative uh, fuel breaks around the community. And I'll show you a map of this in a second. Uh, and just a lot of planning, right? They prepared for a worst case scenario. And they did this over about 20 years, okay? Uh, they spent about $2 million on that. And I'll give you some context for that in just a second. Uh, so this is what it looked like, right? It involved a lot of thinning. It involved a lot of road brushing, right? Getting a lot of the vegetation back. Um, they did this great thing where they said, okay, if we ask people to clear the properties, right, they're not going to do it because they don't have a truck to take stuff to the dump. They don't know where they're going to put the brush, all these sorts of things. So we're going to rent a chipper and we're going to have neighborhood chipping day. And if everybody brings all their brush from their property down to the end of the driveway, we'll chip it and haul it off. Works fantastic, right? Uh, and yeah, just a lot of clearing of understory vegetation. In December of 2017, this was all put to the test. The Thomas fire started on December 4th. Yes, that's winter for us. Uh, and it occurred under incredibly dry, hot drought conditions uh, and a catabatic hot wind event uh, where fires come down slope through mountain passes, or sorry, winds come down slope through mountain passes and just blow fires up. Uh, most of our fatal fire events happen associated with those type of winds. And this fire grew for about two weeks before it came uh, to the place where it was going to impact Montecito. And what happened was, it made a run, uh, basically the top of this is the highest elevation, the bottom of this picture is low elevation. Uh, so basically this fire was pushed downhill against topography uh, into this community and the winds were strong enough that it made a run of uh, four kilometers in about six hours. And when it hit this community, uh, 
got around a lot of the houses, about 100 houses inside the fire perimeter, um, and then it didn't go any further. And so we did this analysis after the fire to ask, okay, what happened when it hit the community? How did all their preparatory work uh, impact it? And what happened was they had this giant fuel break network. Uh, and all this light green stuff is defensible space around homes. All these dark green lines that are squiggly are part of their, what they call their uh, fuel treatment network. It's basically green fire breaks. Um, the fire hit that and just died. And so the firefighters were able to safely go in and help put out all the little spot fires around houses and pull, you know, flaming eucalyptus limbs off of people's roofs and that sort of thing. Uh, and it literally saved uh, 93 out of 100 houses within the fire perimeter and then several hundred houses just downhill. Median home price in this town is four and a half million dollars. Oprah doesn't live in a small house, okay. Uh, so over 20 years, they invested $2 million US and they saved hundreds of homes worth millions of dollars each. Pretty darn good investment. Meanwhile, for the flora side of the equation, Yosemite National Park is one of our uh, World Heritage Sites. And, uh, well, they're not paleoendemics, but the giant sequoia are pretty darn special trees. Uh, and they in the redwoods, they're actually the tallest trees. They beat your eucalyptus regnans. Uh, we won't talk about that. Uh, but these guys are actually really fire adapted. Um, so they have incredibly thick bark. You can see on this one, huge fire scar, right? They've survived a lot of fire. One of the major concerns for US fire managers and ecologists is, okay, well, they survived fire in the past, but now we're seeing really different types of fire intensity. And there's only 72 groves of these trees in the entire world. And they're all in Yosemite and Sequoia, Kings Canyon. In national parks. Uh, so they don't want to lose these things. So what are they doing? They're raking needles away from the trunks of the trees when fires are happening. Um, I'll refrain from the Donald Trump raking joke. Uh, they're doing a lot of prescribed burning because these trees are fire adapted. So they're clearing out a lot of the understory dead fuels and vegetation with an enormous amount of controlled burning. They are using sprinklers, so if you saw pictures uh, in the paper on TV here and you're like, why is Parks and TFS using sprinklers? Yeah, we do it too in the US, and guess what? It works. Uh, and personal favorite, and yeah, we wrap our huts in foil too. And it works, right? What's, what's really interesting about this is that these are parks that they tried throwing the entire kitchen sink in terms of fire suppression. They used to do enormous amounts of water bombing and uh, dropping fire retardant and just sending tons and tons of people in there, uh, all of our super specialized crews like smoke jumpers and hot shots and all those sorts of things. They would send everything in there and really try and suppress these fires and it didn't work. And they spent so much money, it was ridiculous. So they started doing this, and now they're doing point protection. They're protecting the huts. They're protecting the other types of cultural sites. We have all these uh, native cultural sites in here. Uh, and they're protecting the giant sequoia groves using these very low-tech methods. It's a heck of a lot cheaper, and they're finding that it's much, much more effective. So for Tasmania, something to think about moving forward Right? I heard a lot of calls in the media and otherwise for sort of trying to throw enormous amounts of money and resources and technology and bringing over the big water bombers from the US to save this vegetation, this paleoendemic vegetation. Um, what we have found, again, it's a different system. I don't know if it will work here, but what we found is that these low tech solutions work a lot better and they're much more cost effective. So what did we learn from 2019, or what did I learn actually from, uh, from Tasmania? Uh, some of the targeted suppression that was undertaken here by parks and by TFS did actually work really well. Those paleoendemic sites didn't have the enormous fire impact that they could have. Um, and in part, it's, 
it's much easier to do point protection because you're talking about a really small perimeter to try and defend versus trying to put out the entire perimeter of the Riveau Road fire or the Gel River fire, right? Those are huge long perimeters. So if you try and suppress the whole darn fire, that's a heck of a lot harder than just protecting that small area that's really critical. Uh, from the community side, there was a couple surprises, right? A long duration evacuation was not something that people in the Huon Valley expected. Um, and preparing communities for that sort of potential is a major challenge for the future here. You've not had it in the past. Most of the time, Tasmanian fires have been relatively short duration, right? And so that'll be a critical thing moving forward. Um, and also thinking about secondary effects like how tourism is impacted by those long duration events. Um, the third key thing is that communication is really critical. One of the things that I have heard um, and seen uh, over the past several weeks is that there's a lot of uh, the public asking where are the fires, what's going on. Um, and you know, TFS has a website that has a lot of the perimeters on them. Uh, what we have found in the states is that um, the fire agencies had these websites that were sort of um, one-dimensional in certain ways. And they figured out that they could use technology to really improve information dissemination. Uh, Twitter is actually one of the best places to get fire information in the US. People are always on their mobile phones and there's a zillion people out there taking pictures of fire. Firefighters are taking pictures and posting it on Twitter and those sorts of things. Uh, and initially the fire agencies were terrified. They're like, oh no, we can't, we can't have all these people posting pictures that are you know, firefighters, and then they realized, oh, the public loves this. And it's good for us to have that informal communication. Um, so now they actually are endorsing it and they're okay with that. They've developed apps and things like that. Uh, one of the things that I understand is happening here is that uh, some folks here at Utah's are working with TFS to uh, develop or have, have already developed an app uh, called Firewatch to basically make that information available at people's fingertips. Really important moving forward. So for those of you that are on the science side, thinking about how to convey information, using technology, linking it to smartphones, really critical thing to improving that communication because communication is critical to facilitating trust. Okay, so in summary, oh, I'm running out of time. All right, the bushfires this year, I know they were big, I know they were scary. My perspective is that they were not a disaster. And that is going to be a paradigm shift for people here to think about. What's really a major disaster? It can be a small fire with lots of fatalities, a small fire with lots of infrastructure consumed, okay? A really big fire that doesn't have that level of negative impact, it may not actually be a disaster. It may just be a lot of fire all at once. There's enormous potential for these types of years to happen in the future. And so preparing for that potential is a key step going forward. Getting public, the public used to the idea that there's going to be a lot more fire here, that it's not all bad, and that the fire agencies are taking the key steps to protect the things that are top priority. Life safety, infrastructure, and those paleoendemic areas. That will be a key piece moving forward. And identifying local bottom-up solutions involving communities, involving the public, is a key piece to making that planning effective when wildfires happen. And with that, I will say thank you to the many folks who helped contribute to this, and I'm happy to take any questions.
own dedicated set of resources. So it's yeah. like dual responsibility here. And I think that, like, frankly, I think that most of the stuff that you were talking in a general sense does not apply to the Gondwana flora. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there was, so in that Gondwana flora space, yes, there was work done by TFS and Parks to protect our land. But as soon as Jeevesen was threatened, all the resources were sucked out and went to protecting Jeevesen and built environments. Yeah. Um, there was no suppression efforts made around Mount Bolt, which is arguably more important than, than, than um, Mount Ronnie. I think the key point is that, yes, I agree with you, we did dodge a bullet this year substantially. <coughs> However, there is incremental loss that happens this year, and that is repeated you know, in three years' time and two years' time, within 30, 40 years. We will have lost as much as we lost if it were a catastrophic year. I think the key point is that it could have. We were only one day, one one hot, windy day away from disaster. The boss going and going, yeah. you came to going the top going, going the lot going, the best of the combine floor again, and that is the key point. Not so much, you know, the fact that we dodged a bullet, but we were only we survived by luck. It's rushing the land for the combine for us, and that to me is utterly unacceptable. And we do need to change our practices mm -hmm. to make sure that you know we actually have protection. Yeah, so for those of you who couldn't hear, um, it, it, the, I think the main point here is that uh, there's a really different need for the wilderness and the Gondwanan forest versus the communities and the infrastructure. And right now there's only one one fire management approach. Uh, and when the communities are threatened, it pulls a lot of the resources uh, from the wilderness areas, all of them. Um, and, and yeah, so because we have a different structure in the U.S., um, th that has been facilitated such that now our national parks have their own fire personnel. They didn't used to, right? It didn't, it used to be one approach, the same as I'm observing here. Uh, and they have changed that over the years so that now the parks have their own fire personnel. They actually developed something about 20 years ago in the U.S. parks called a fire use module. And those are individuals that are 100% dedicated to managing fire in the park system only. Um, and that is something for Parks has to, you know, potentially look at and see if they have the resources to do that, to see if that's something that they can develop in a way that works for Tasmania. Because it is a really different management approach. Um, preparing communities will also help because if communities are better prepared, you don't have to send the entire world to protect the community when it starts to be threatened, right? Um, and, and you are going to have more years where you have multiple fires all over the place. Uh, so trying to figure out how to restructure and develop these divergent management approaches to address these two very different systems and uh, systems from a, a fire management perspective is gonna be key moving forward. Um, so that, that's, that is an excellent point. And I think that there are systems globally that can help inform that. Parks Canada um, and Canadian Forest Service also have a very divergent approach. One more question. Yeah. You mentioned how um, in your summer in those four states in the US, it was the whole summer when the smoke was the problem. Yeah. And you mentioned also that there's been no fatalities here this year. But the, I think you know, Faye is probably doing some work right now to figure out if there are smoke induced fatalities that have happened. Yeah. What is, like, that's that kind of secondary level. What are the strategies that you can do to actually address smoke across the broad landscapes and cities like this? Because, you know, it was, it was suffocating. Yeah. We were living through and we had it for about two weeks. Yeah, it, you don't realize how much the chronic impact can really accumulate uh, to affect you until you start living through it. Uh, so um, it, this is an area where the U.S. is considerably behind. I would say that uh, Faye Johnston's group is doing some of the world-leading research on understanding um, biomass burning smoke impacts, particularly controlled fire versus wildfire, because in the U.S., the uh, the advocacy is for more controlled burning, and the assumption un underlying that is that uh, it basically distributes the smoke across a year or several years instead of getting it all at once. Um, 
actually quantifying that and modeling it, I think, is the challenge for scientists in that realm. Uh, because this is something that has not been quantified well in the U.S., is to what extent that chronic smoke exposure induces mortality uh, versus the acute effect of being burned up in a wildfire. Um, so that that is an area that we have a huge research need, uh, and it's definitely something that, um, you know, it, yeah, in, in the U.S., they basically just advocate for controlled burning so that you have dispersion of smoke across a year, multiple years, instead of all at once. But other than that, solutions have not been forthcoming. Okay, we've got to wrap it up now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.